From Washington, our team of investigators stalked the legendary Bigfoot. I think we scared him as much as he scared us. Have they finally captured Sasquatch with heat-sensitive radar? Yeah, I see him. Hello, I'm John Marshall, and welcome to Encounters, the Hidden Truth. You know, one of the most popular legends of the unexplained goes by a somewhat ridiculous nickname, Bigfoot. But behind the legend, there may lie some startling truths. I traveled to the wilds of Washington to separate fact from conjecture, and I learned one thing. There is a good reason why this legend has endured for thousands of years. Native Americans in the Pacific Northwest called it Sasquatch. European settlers called it Bigfoot, but everyone calls it a mystery. Is it possible that the missing link between man and ape roams these dense forests? To the hundreds of eyewitnesses who have seen this huge creature, the answer is a definitive yes. When I turned the headlights on him, I think we scared him as much as he scared us. It brought its hand up to block the light, let out a uh, just scary scream. We were looking at it, and our brains wouldn't register what it was because we'd never seen anything like this before. When I made eye contact with it, it was not like looking at in an animal's eyes. And uh, even though there was some distance, it, it was not like looking at an animal. There was intelligence there on the other side of its eyes. Although every one of these eyewitnesses describes a different sighting, every encounter shares one thing, the enormous size of the creature. He was about eight feet tall. I weighed 200 pounds at that time, and he was a good 350 to 400 pounds heavier than me. His arms were as thick as my thigh. Eyewitness testimony may hold up in court, but science demands further evidence. And the most dramatic evidence collected to date is this film clip shot near Yakima, Washington in the fall of 1967. If it's a man in an ape suit, anthropologist Grover Krantz finds the performance brilliant, if not impossible. I went through it uh, frame by frame, uh, measuring everything I could on it, what the body proportions were, and I can state flatly that there is no human being alive who can fit into a costume with the dimensions that are shown there. Maybe it's a man who's got his elbows out, and that's the shoulders, but then any man of that height, the elbows are much too far apart to be the shoulders. There's only one way you can do it. You get a six and a half foot tall man, and go one third out along his upper arm, break it, and introduce a new joint. There is other evidence that Bigfoot exists, huge footprints, hair samples, and droppings. But we decided to look for fresh evidence and maybe a first-hand encounter. We decided to go to the area with the most recent and concentrated sightings, Grays Harbor, Washington, a scenic county at the base of the Olympic Peninsula. Thickly forested, it's a place where a large animal could hide for a long time. Undaunted, we put together a team of witnesses, technical experts, and trappers to see if we couldn't capture Bigfoot on videotape. Uh, the rough spots, what I'd say, would be about halfway to where that clear cut it's is. It's 6 o'clock in the morning. The maps are being read. The strategy is being planned. This is the last step before we head into the backcountry to look for Bigfoot. The remote backwoods area we're headed for is a place where Bigfoot was spotted just three months ago. Our hunt is nothing new. People have been searching hundreds of years for a creature whose heritage may trace back more than a million. This is the jaw of the Gigantopithecus that was found in China. This is a large adult male, and it's only the tooth-bearing part of the jaw that we have. I'm trying to figure out what the rest of the skull would look like, I came up with this reconstruction for the skull. This, then, is roughly what I think the uh, Gigantopithecus entire skull would look like. And I also expect that this is approximately what a Sasquatch skull would look like. We've made it to the end of the road. From here on out, there's nothing but nature between us and our quarry. 
Although some people outside the Pacific Northwest might scoff at an expedition like this, around here, Bigfoot is taken very seriously. So seriously that one nearby county has declared it a crime to hunt him. If you do kill a Bigfoot there, and if it turns out he's a species closely related to man, you could face murder charges and prison time. Some people believe the only way to prove Bigfoot's existence is to kill one. But on this expedition, the only shooting will be done on video. Not that we wouldn't mind finding one that died of natural causes. We don't believe in killing one just to prove it exists, but we hope maybe someday we'll come across skeletal remains when we're out here, or, or, or one that's recently died on its own, or, or something. But animals that die of natural causes aren't easy to find. If an animal dies on its own, it has the opportunity to choose a place where it dies. And these we virtually never find. Uh, nobody's ever found a bear that died a natural death that I've been able to locate. After establishing camp, we set out to scout the area for signs of the creature. Bigfoot is probably the best known animal in the world of cryptozoology, the study of animals that are suspected but unproven. And probably the best example of a cryptozoological animal, or cryptid as we sometimes call them, would be the African gorilla. These were considered by the European scientists to be totally mythological beasts until the first skin and skull came into a European collection in the year 1849. Larry Lund hunted deer and elk in the woods of the Northwest for 20 years. Then he put away his guns and set out after Bigfoot. When we follow trails, and especially along the riverbeds, we look for anything that's out of the ordinary for the normal animals of the area. We look for footprints, droppings, uh, large disturbed areas. Larry spent most of his time searching for tracks along a nearby creek. Here we have a, it's probably a doe track. Yeah, it is a doe track. These leaves be pressed inside it made me curious why they were stuck down the ground, it's, it, but it is just a doe track. He found plenty of deer and elk tracks, but nothing out of the ordinary. Meanwhile, Forrester this, Wayne Moore and former deep? Sheriff's Deputy Fred Bradshaw led me into the high country. Later that afternoon, we found something unusual. You see something? There's an impression right here. Yeah. That's a good possible right here. You got the toes, uh, the cut edges along here for the heel. And that'd be a, at least a good 14-inch track. And given what we see here, I mean, what does it tell us about the stride? How, I mean, in terms of the, the height, of the bigness of the animal? Well, if you, if you allow that that is a, a track, then you've got a six-foot stride. And a uh, six-foot stride would be extraordinary. Would it help to make a cast of this? Yes, uh -huh. it would uh, show with the, when you pour a casting of it, it'll pick up more of the foot impression if it, if it is anything at all. We use a plaster that is easy to mix and quick to harden. The entire process took about 20 minutes. This one's not probably one of the best ones that they've ever had, but it appears that it does have toes in it. Uh, there's one, two, three, Four, and then uh, it appears to be a large one over on this side. Maybe, but the tracks led nowhere, and a few footprints made in mossy ground were not the definitive proof we were looking for. Stalking Bigfoot is no easy game. He's proven himself to be an extremely elusive quarry. To catch him on tape, we've devised a trap that includes everything from trip wires and motion detectors to floodlights and video cameras. Now, everything is set to work automatically, but we'll also rig an alarm that will alert us to Bigfoot's presence. Sasquatch researcher Todd Nice staked out a rock quarry near our base camp. Bigfoot uh, purportedly has been seen digging up uh, rodents uh, on a couple of occasions. First, he laid bait. And if we had it in one piece, it'd probably be gone in two seconds, but if we break it up, it gives him a reason to hang around a little bit. The strategy here is to lure the creature within range of our infrared sensors and floodlights. It's my hope that the shock of the lights may give us an extra 10, 15 second filming time. He also set traps in the forest nearby. Immediately around my bivouac site, I will have uh, some trip wires, which will also set off a high-pitched beep should we get anything right in the campsite itself. Yet another kind of trap would illuminate any large animal entering the area. The Native Americans who lived in these forests were very familiar with the creature. Physical anthropologists study the stone carvings they left behind. It's not any of the animals that's normally encountered in the area. 
because the uh, Indians carved uh, representations of all the animals that we know. This one appears to be ape-like. The only uh, explanation that anyone's been able to come up with is whoever carved this was familiar with the face of a, something like a Sasquatch. When an alarm sounded later that evening, Todd was there within seconds. Something definitely hit it because when I found it, it was pulled up here. And something had to have struck this trip line pretty good. Pretty elusive, whatever it was. The rest of the night was a waiting game. Ultimately, it became clear that no one was taking our bait. But the hunt wasn't over yet. It's now 5.30 in the morning, and we're about to catch up with the linchpin of our operation. It's a Bell Jet Ranger helicopter, specially equipped with infrared heat-seeking instruments. If Bigfoot is anywhere near here, the chopper will detect his body heat. The crew will then radio us of his position and continue to track him from the air until we can catch up with him. Are the ground conditions cool enough for you down here? Are there any problems with that? Yeah, this is uh, optimum conditions for infrared. Coordinating their movements with the team on the ground, the helicopter crew covers a 25-square-mile grid. Any warm-blooded animal in the area should register on the cockpit monitor. At first, the woods look empty. But a few minutes out, we see a warm area in the brush where a large creature seems to have been bedded down for the night. It can't be far away. And then we spot something alive in the underbrush. It looks tall, and it's huge. Right, uh, 60 degrees. Right, 60 degrees. Okay, I'm going to swing around to the right, and maybe we can identify them. They're directly below us on the right side. There's two of them standing together, barely moving. The remainder of our aerial search uncovers plenty of elk, but no evidence of Bigfoot. But that doesn't necessarily mean he isn't out here. Obviously, if the animal is uh, well hidden, the infrared can't pick them up in a cave or under a very uh, dense tree cover. If Bigfoot does live in the thousands of square miles of forest that make up the Pacific Northwest, we'll need more resources to spot him. But our trip wasn't for nothing. When you're dealing with this type of phenomenon, you're not seeking final answers. You're seeking increments in the puzzle, small pieces, small bits. And consequently, anything that you develop is more than you had before. Now, Russell, I can well understand how a live Bigfoot would elude trackers, but uh, all creatures have to die sometime, so where are the bones? Well, John, you'd really have to travel these woods to appreciate just how immense they are. If we assume that Bigfoot is the ultimate endangered species, there may be only a handful left alive. The odds of finding bones are stacked against us. The proverbial needle in a haystack. We'll be right back.